Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I'm Professor Joe Kay, and I'm the head of the department here in SDS, if you didn't already know that. Let me ask if you can find a convenient moment, if you happen to see a couple of seats on the inside, uh, if you could just squidge yourself in a direction that will allow a latecomer to arrive without embarrassing themselves so much as to ask here, would you please sit, stand up and then shift in? Because we're filming tonight, and they'll be on film and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> It'll be great, a YouTube moment, wouldn't it? OK, well, we'll pass along. Anyway, so as head of department, my job is to introduce the introducer for the, for the talk tonight. And so I'll be very brief. The JBS Day Lecture, see? The, uh, 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 the uh, JBS Day Lecture is something that uh, we started a couple of years ago in conversations about having uh, here in STS, speakers who are the best, most exciting people in our community. We wanted to, we wanted to bring you know, the most outstanding because we're we're a cutting edge research department, we're a cutting edge teaching department, and we love the stuff that we do. And the best people just excite us so much. So the JBS Haldane lecture was named and started with that concept in mind. Why JBS Haldane? UCL, polymath, J, uh, JBS Haldane's interest in science policy and the politics of science, sociology of science, history of science, and of course, philosophy of science. One of the few people that in UCL's past that covers the whole range of all the things we do in SDS. So we're pretty excited about JBS Haldane and the stuff he got up to, which is why we got this lecture started. See, I told you, late covers. Welcome, welcome, welcome. But also, we saved them from singling them out, like Bernie, to, uh, <laughs> to, to sit. So, well, thank you very much for coming. Anyway, so, it gives me very great pleasure to move on. It gives me very great pleasure to move on to Brendan Clark, who will introduce the, the speaker for tonight. Brendan. Thank you very much, Joe, and uh, good evening and welcome, everyone. I've, I've promised uh, Heather that I will keep this introduction short, mm. so I will keep it short. Um, so, Heather's talking to us this evening about how the public can explain expertise. As with so much of her work, this really cuts across uh, so many strands of work that we do here in SDS, and I was just thinking a bit about some of the examples, the evidence-based medicine work, or... Uh, in, about RRI and research innovation or geoengineering and on and on and on and on it goes. Um, what I want to do really is just give a very short introduction to how Heather's come to be here and, and, and talking about this kind of thing to us. So Heather originally trained in the HPS department at Pittsburgh as a philosopher of science. Now hold the groans just for a second. Her thesis was on uh, the role of values in dioxin research. Um, and this is a research program that she's built up magnificently, concluding really, I suppose, in the 2009 book, uh, which is Science, Policy, and the Value-Free Ideal, uh, which is something that is on, I think I found it on five different reading lists across the department, so that's pretty great, isn't it? I like it. Um, if only I'd known in advance, I'd put it on a few more as well, because a big number there, an even bigger number would have been there, would have been great there. Um, and she's currently working at Waterloo in Canada, although I'm, I'm able to indiscreetly reveal that she's planning a move. Uh, well, I, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll let Heather talk about that. In, you can just I can say it. Well, just okay, say it. Yeah. She's going to stay yeah. in, uh, in the fall, so that's, uh, that's very, very exciting news. Um, and uh, so, really, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, and over, over to you. Thank you so much, Brendan. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I really appreciate the invitation. And uh, I apologize for having to delay it. Um, sometimes the spirit is willing, but the body puts its foot down, put its foot down as it were. And uh, I am really thrilled that I'm actually able to travel again. <laughs> so uh, what I want to do this evening is talk about how the public can assess expertise. Um, so expertise is, is one of those topics that's really come roaring to the fore over the past couple of years, particularly as we have uh, a whole set of sort of crises. Um, it seems clear to me that 
We can't do without expertise. Our world is really complicated. And uh, even though um, we have all kinds of wonderful information technologies available to us, uh, it's really hard to make good judgments about the kinds of complexity that we face that we have to make decisions about. So if we want to grapple with both known and emerging diseases, for example, if we want to grapple well with uh, how to actually run our information technologies, um, how to manage our big data systems, um, how to actually protect our environment or exploit it sustainably, we're going to need experts to help us figure out how to think about these systems. And none of us can actually attempt to master all of this complexity anymore. Um, I'm not even sure like, how many lifetimes it would take to read even some subset of what has been written on things. Um, nor can we even master a, a single subset of it. I mean, we all know that we're, we're very specialized in our own individual <coughs> areas of expertise. Um, so we're going to need some expertise to navigate this complexity. But experts can be wrong. <laughs> they certainly were wrong, for example, about the financial crisis of 2008. Most recently, um, they've been wrong about things like Vioxx, uh, which turned out to be far more deadly than we thought they were wrong about. Diethylstilbestrol, they are wrong about whether or not there was a meltdown inside Three Mile Island after the accident happened. They were wrong about H, uh, the, the cause of cervical cancer. Um, so there's like a history of experts being wrong. Experts can also just be opaque. We can have difficulties interpreting what they're talking about. Come on, we're just starting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, you know, even when they're not opaque, they can disagree with each other, and then you have to figure out which ones to, to use. And then there are times when experts just tell us stuff we don't want to hear, um, and it's hard to figure out whether or not to take them on board when they tell us things like, you know, there's a 2% chance that humans will go extinct this century which some experts will say. Or, uh, probably much better grounded, it's not clear that that's really a well-grounded thing that experts say, um, we have to deal with climate change, and we probably have to stop using fossil fuels in the next 30 to 40 years. Now, that's a really hard thing to say, especially I come from a very cold place right now, and there is not really a good way to heat my house without fossil fuels. So, exactly how is this supposed to work? So, um, this uh, kind of um, failures uh, among experts create a sort of a growing unease about expertise. And it's made worse by, um, no, we don't have to do that yet. Um, it's made worse by uh, the um, uh, way in which financial interests have gr uh, glommed on to the fact that expertise is a really important part of public decision making, and so it's become a, a way to, you know, you can manufacture the expertise and support experts to say the things you want to hear. So um, we have lots of worries about expertise. The, the good news, I guess, is that um, at least for the, the purple line is the scientists. This is trust data on um, experts from the UK and from 2014. I tried to find a more recent one post-Brexit. But I don't think anyone's done any surveys. This, this, uh, whether this changed um, around the Brexit debate, I don't really know. The good news is uh, trust, you know, if you do these sort of do you trust a particular group to tell the truth or not, you know, the top one, amazingly, is doctors still. Like, wow. The gray line just below that, teachers, not bad. The sort of one that's declining, that's, that's the clergy. <laughs> so we should be surprised. Look at the scientists, they didn't start asking here in the UK until the mid 90s. I guess nobody really worried about scientists. But then, you know, it's actually gone, gone up a little bit. That's, that's not bad. So, general trust and expertise. And then it goes down from there. The, the blue line is the police. I have no idea where the police is trusted so much here. Yeah. <laughs> Civil servants are here. And then way down here, this is politicians and journalists battling it out for the bottom. Um, <laughs> No one's particularly surprised by that. OK, but this is also true in, in the US. There's been a relative stability about um, you know, sort of the confidence in. The, the US is generally less trusting about all kinds of things. It's sort of like distrust is a big part of American culture. But you know, among people who are like, how much this is a great deal of confidence in the people of these institutions. And there's the scientific community. It's been steady since the 70s. 
So it's not like there's like this huge, it might seem like there's this huge decline in expertise, trust in expertise and reliance on expertise generally, but that doesn't seem to be the case. However, if you start getting into the demographics of it, it gets kind of bleak. So this is a poll, uh, some a guy who did some uh, survey of numbers on people in the US. The blue uh, diamonds are liberals. The black triangles are moderates. And there's the conservatives tanking down <laughs> in the level of trust in science uh, over the last 30 years. So that's, that's really where a lot of the worries come from, is in particular demographic groups, you see this dramatic decline in a, a sort of a trust and expertise. And in some issues, so there's like, you know, is it safe to eat genetically modified foods? Well, AAA scientists are way up here, 88%, US adults, 37%. And scientists go, ah, oh, why don't they believe us? Um, I know, if we just educate them more, they'll believe us. We all know that's not going to work. Deficit model. No, no. And same thing with climate change. There's a huge gap there. Um, the other ones favor use in animals and research. And I am doing the thing. I'm not talking into your microphone. Okay. Um, or, or is it safe to eat foods from pesticides? Like, this is humans have evolved over time. Mm. <laughs> Don't even know what to say about that. So there's this issue of whether or not we actually might have a crisis. And we've had things like marches for science, the worries about alternative facts. Tom Nichols wrote this book about you know, the death of expertise. And everyone goes, oh no, and the enlightenment is ending finally. I'm going to go back to the dark age. In fact, I should have put up Elijah Milgram's book, The Great Endarkenment, where he argues that we're undoing everything about the enlightenment. And then, uh, you know, people do sort of have the feeling that all professions are conspiracies against the laity, that maybe there's something to that. So how should we proceed in the face of all of this sort of um, storm and drang about expertise? So what I want to do today is argue that uh, first we need a better understanding of the nature of expertise, particularly scientific expertise, and a clear understanding of why and when we can assess expertise without becoming experts ourselves. So this is the challenge. How do we assess experts without demanding expertise to do it? And I'm going to propose three bases on which to do this. So I'm going to actually answer this question with what is nicely called a tripod of trust. You'll find out it's not really three, but three is always a nice number. OK, so <laughs> the first uh, basis that we'll talk about is a sort of a baseline assessment. This is about the nature of expertise and whether or not you can ass uh, assess the expert readily on the basis of the sort of short-term success or whether we need to demand something else. Then I'll talk a bit about the social conditions of expertise. And then finally, I'll talk about values and experts, which is, of course, what everyone expects. Um, okay, so let's talk about the nature of expertise. So what is expertise? It can't just be having knowledge or a collection of information at your fingertips, because that would exactly make us experts. We all have Google, we have the internet, we even have the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and various encyclopedias all available, we can search them. But that doesn't make us experts in any of these domains. So what is it that imparts expertise isn't just um, having knowledge, it's a, an ability to make judgments about the nature of that knowledge. It's an ability to um, see what is important, see what is probably not important in any particular situation within one's ex domain of expertise. So you might encounter a situation as an expert that is new and different compared to other things you've encountered before, but within your domain, and you know how to sort of see what's important about it and what's not perhaps important, and to make judgments accordingly, and which questions to ask, which things to pursue, which things to let aside. It's that kind of fluency in dealing with information in new contexts that we need experts desperately for, and it's that very kind of fluency that we are actually most lacking in as non-experts. Right? That's the thing that's really hard for us. Okay. Part of this is, you know, the ability to ask crucial questions. Part of this is also knowing where your expertise will begin to break down and where you might need to go ask for someone else's help in something. Um, but it, it's all having uh, a tactile feel for what is, uh, you know, important in one's area. 
And I think we're each experts, certainly in this room, we're each experts in some domains, I think actually in general, even members, every member of the public is an expert in some domain, and non-experts in many, many others. Right. Okay. Now, so what to do with that? Some experts, um, are, it's really easy to tell when um, they're experts, but those experts are also the experts that aren't very often good at explicating their nature of their judgments. This is fine, though. You can have an, I, you know, I might have an expert car mechanic who um, can't tell me why they think it's that widget in the car that's making the noise. But every time she says it's the particular thing she says it is and fixes it, the car runs beautifully again. And so I just keep going back to the mechanic. It doesn't matter that she can't explain to me what is going on with my car. And in fact, it might just be better off in a lot of cases for me not to know. She'll just say, like, when that light comes on again, this is what you do. And I'm, okay, I just you know rely on you because every time she's right. We also see this with chess masters. Um, a lot of chess masters can't tell you why they make the moves they do. They can't explicate the nature of the judgment. But you know they're making the right move because they win. It's super easy. That's how we pick the chess master. They're the ones that win against the other good players. All right, now, so these are the easy experts. We, you know, the chess players, the Go players, we've got computerized versions of these, there's car mechanics, I'm sure the computerized version of that's coming. Um, athletes are experts in their field, the ones that win games. Um, Aristotle talks about cooks, expert cooks. Uh, Dewey talks about expert shoemakers and the public and its problems. Um, and, you know, we can tell when we have an expertly made meal because of the way it tastes. Success is easy to assess. Trusting and relying and assessing these experts is not the problem in front of us today. These are the easy ones. And theories of expertise that build off of those miss the challenge of moving this is a spectrum, not like a dichotomy, okay? This is a spectrum. So just pretend, I don't know how to do PowerPoint slides that make it a spectrum, I'm not an expert. <laughs> <laughs> so move over here to where it's really hard to tell whether or not the expert <coughs> is getting it right, at least in the term, the kind of time frames we'd like to do. I mean, we could wait to see whether the climate models pan out, but by then we're toast. We can't wait that long. We have to decide whether or not to act on the basis of the models before 100 years goes by and before we see whether or not their predictions actually turn out to be accurate. Same thing um, with sort of a different problem with epidemiologists. Um, for people trying to figure out what is the cause of public health problems, I mean, they could round up a bunch of you and experiment on you and see how you respond over 20 years. But we decided that's a really bad idea for very good reasons. It's morally abhorrent. So we're not allowed to do experiments directly on humans in control conditions. So we have to do proxies. We try to look at ex existing populations and find other populations that have similar characteristics but are not, you know, not exposed to the factor we're interested in. We might also look at animal studies and hope that the animals are sufficiently similar. We can put the animals in control conditions. Still, but they're proxies for us. We all know that rats actually aren't humans. And a lot of judgments have to be made about whether or not they're good models. And we haven't gotten all the biochemistry down. If you talk to a biochemist about the complexity of the cell, you'll know why. It's super amazing, interestingly complicated in there. So we don't know exactly how these things affect cells. And certainly, even if we had a diesel account of how something affected, in, a chemical affected someone, a cell inside, that, that might not translate to how it affects an entire body. So in vitro experiments are not the same as in vivo experiments. So instead of waiting for a clear marker of success, we have to do something else. We can't just sort of hope that these things would pop out with something obviously correct. And yet it is these experts that we need to navigate our complicated world. Right, those are the ones that are challenging for us. All right, so what, what should we do? How do we find, how do we figure out how to assess such experts? 
And given that part of expertise is making judgments, if you don't have the ability to readily assess the success of a judgment in the short term, the thing we have to ask of experts is that they be able to explain their judgment. So Juliana articulates this beautifully in her paper dealing with moral expertise, but I think it is generalizable to expertise generally. She writes, expertise requires that the expert, unlike the mere muddler, or the person with the unintellectual knack be able to give an account of what it is that she is an expert in. The expert, but not the dabbler, can explain why she is doing what she is doing instead of being stuck with inarticulacy, of being reduced to saying that it feels right this way, it's just what my gut tells me. She can explain why this is, here and now, the appropriate thing to do or think in these circumstances. So an explication criterion is crucial for knowing that someone is, in fact, an expert if they can't rely upon raw success to demonstrate their expertise. And the more that you can um, have difficulty in assessing raw success, the more we want experts to be able to do this sort of explaining of judgments and to say why, here and now, this is the appropriate thing to do or think in these circumstances. So this is the first basis uh, uh, for assessing experts, to demand an explication. Or, you know, you can assess for success. That's the easy thing to do. But in the cases we're interested in, and that I'll be talking about for the, most of the, the remainder of the talk, it is this explication criterion that's really crucial. Um, it is, you know, we need this to know whether or not someone actually has expertise, because it's to demonstrate the fluency of judgment. Now, you might think, what are you doing in demanding that an expert explain their judgment? Isn't that sort of saying they have to impart the expertise to me? Quite the opposite. Very often when um, I've had conversations with experts and asked them to explain why they think. Um, first of all, the ones who do it well, uh, you know, do it in, uh, with as little jargon as possible. So they actually you know, use language that most of us can understand. Um, knowing that, that it does a bit of a shortcut and it's fine, Hearing that kind of explanation does not by any means turn me into an expert. In fact, usually what it does is make very clear to me how, I am, how far I am from having expertise. So when you hear an expert explain their judgment, it doesn't turn or impart their expertise to you. It just demonstrates what is required to have fluency of judgment in that situation. As I say, it shows how much complexity, with how much complexity the expert is actually grappling in practice. Um, and very often, I find myself, uh, when I have these sort of experiences, just kind of in awe. Like, wow, OK, so it would take 10 years to bone up on your particular subfield, and, and I'm just not going to. I'm going to just listen to what you have to say about this. So that's the first basis. However, you know, most philosophers who deal with um, uh, expertise so far, have actually focused instead on the community, because the experts that we depend upon are created and honed within a community of expertise. So the uh, tr traditional um, or you know, classic papers in this by Goldman, you know, is the expert trained? You go find out whether they have a, the right kind of degree, whether they have the uh, right kind of degree from the right kind of institution. Are they participating within an expert community? Um, do they have publications that are hopefully in a peer-reviewed form in the field? Do they go to conferences and give talks there? Um, do they have prizes and grants that are often bestowed by peers? So all this depends upon there being some kind of social epistemic community that is functioning. Otherwise, these things are meaningless. You know, if you get your degree online because you paid 100 bucks, that's not what this is. Right? This, this requires an expert community that is instantiated like uh, the SDS program here at UCL. <laughs> um, OK, so this is clearly very important, but just the presence of an expert community is not going to be enough uh, to assess expertise. We need a well-functioning expert community. And here we can turn to the work of someone like Helen Longino, who argues in her work that it's not just the presence of an expert community. You have to actually make sure things like um, 
There have to be forums for exchanging ideas. Those are the conferences that people go to, so that's not so difficult, it's kind of overlapping. Um, they need to have some shared standards so they know how to talk to each other. You want to make sure there's temperate intellectual <coughs> equality, although I'm not going to suggest that you know, this is something you can have really super strong evidence of, but you know, is there sort of someone whose views are never challenged? <coughs> that's a problem. Are there responses to criticisms when work criticism is raised? Or does, are there members of the community who are really prominent who just never respond to criticisms made of their work? That's a problem. Um, is there a range of views? Have, is it being considered or has it been considered? And finally, you know, is there actually a diverse community? Is it sort of demographically diverse? Now the difficulties with thinking about expertise uh, in this way is the criticism that needs to be responded to can sometimes come from outside of the expert community. And just because it comes from outside of the expert community doesn't mean that it shouldn't be responded to. I want to talk about a case where um, uh, it uh, goes horribly wrong. Um, but um, uh, you know, this is actually fairly well recognized. Uh, Kyle White, and, in a paper with Robert Kreese, talked about the unrecognized contributor problem. The thing that also happens is when criticism comes from outside the expert community, the experts can also behave really badly as a community and circle the wagons. So the I want to talk a little bit about the case of L'Aquila in Italy. Um, you might know about this case. Um, it was a double failure of expertise. So in March of 2009, uh, L'Aquila is a seismically active region um, and with old buildings. So not exactly a great place to have earthquakes. Um, there were tremors. Uh, the response of citizens of L'Aquila to tremors was to spend the night outside in squares. They would leave their homes in the inner city and hang out so they put the kids in cars and the backseat of cars to sleep. Everyone evacuates. The adults hang out in squares. That's the standard response to earthquakes. There was an amateur scientist, Giuliani, who's trying to predict earthquakes with radon detection. Uh, as these tremors were going, he's like, oh, I'm getting a radon spike, a big earthquake's coming, and the public was getting alarmed. So this particular official called a meeting on March 31st of the Major Risk Commission, which was a science advisory body, to reassure the public. And it was after that meeting that the official told the public that the tremors were reducing the risk of a major quake, because it was releasing energy. So this is review. Unfortunately, that was false. Like, not even approximately true. It was patently false. In fact, in this region, it was known by the seismologists in the peer-reviewed literature and by the seismologists in the Risk Commission that the tremors increased the risk over 100 times. So something below 1% to well up to about 2%. So the, the populace was actually quite smart to leave their houses when tremors occurred. Um, and when Bertolasso made these statements... Uh, despite the fact that the head of the Risk Commission was standing right next to him, the scientist says nothing. And over the next four days, the scientists continue to say nothing. So they issue no statements. Say, well, in fact, actually, tremors do increase the risk in this area, but it's still a low risk. It's not likely that there will be an earthquake, but, you know, keep doing what you're doing would have been the sensible thing to say. So on April 6th, a 6.3 magnitude earthquake occurred and killed over 300 people. And in 2010, charges were laid against the L'Aquila 7, which was the major risk commission plus Bertolasso, for manslaughter due to negligence for an inadequate risk assessment. Uh, because 29 deaths could be directly traceable to um, members of the L'Aquila community who heard the reassurance of the risk uh, commission and the official who communicated it in uh, the, the falsehood and changed their behavior and stayed in their homes. And it was highly educated people who trusted science advisory committees to do the right thing, and there's the ones whose kids died. So in 2012, the L'Aquila 7 was convicted and sentenced to six years in prison, and the scientists were eventually quitted on appeal. I'm not going to try to make a decision tonight or any argument about whether or not sending scientists to jail for failing to give an accurate risk assessment is a good idea. What I want to focus on, instead of this particular failure of expertise, this is just experts being negligent in their duties to give an accurate risk assessment. 
And sometimes when you do that, people die. And sometimes when you do that, maybe you're responsible, <coughs> given that it was well known that tremors, in fact, increase the risk. What I want to focus on is the response to the scientific community, which was less than stellar. Um, so it started in 2010. Uh, these are all things actually from 2010 when the charges were first laid. Um, Andrew Revkin in a New York Times article, uh, op-ed piece called, he's a science journalist, called it a medieval style attack on science to charge scientists with what he called failing to predict an earthquake, which was of course not what they were charged with. Uh, Alan Leshner, the president of the AAAS, wrote a letter where he implored the Italian justice community to not pursue these charges because there is no accepted method for earthquake prediction, beside the point, and that there were charges were unfair and naive. The International Union of uh, Geology and Geophysics uh, submitted a um, letter where they ironically wrote, it is shocking and acceptable to accuse and legally indict scientists and members of the governmental panel because they failed to make a prediction of an extreme natural event in a particular place. That would be shocking, it's not what happened, but <laughs> um, no scientist should be prosecuted for having expressed a scientific opinion based on the available knowledge. It's too bad they didn't express the view based on the available knowledge. Okay, so what do we have here? We have, uh, instead of, um, let's go back to this for a minute. We have, uh, instead of actually finding out what the scientists are charged with, the scientific community leaps to their defense. The scientists messed up, and they messed up badly. The scientific community then circled the wagons. Now, this is not appropriate behavior in the face of the criticism that was leveled at the scientists by the judge and the prosecutor in the case. So the prosecutor, think of the prosecutor and the judge as um, actually the prosecutor, because the judge hadn't ruled yet. The judge eventually rules in, as, in, the, in the favor of the prosecutor. Um, the prosecutor is an external member of the scientific community, and instead of dealing carefully with such a criticism and reading about it and thinking carefully about it, the scientific community, and on the basis of their expertise, rallied and said to protect the experts. Okay. So, you know, there was a double failure of expertise at L'Aquila. The scientists failed to correct the false claims made and allowed the science to be used as window dressing for inaccurate statements that they knew were inaccurate. Um, the broader scientific community then failed to hold the scientists accountable. And even when, a couple years later, finally the scientific community realized that these scientists were not being prosecuted for failing to put an earthquake, because that eventually sunk in. Although, I found like an article in 2015 that was still saying, remember that case back in Lockwell when the scientists were prosecuted for failing to predict an earthquake in the Smithsonian Magazine? Right? So like these science outlets. It's like a zombie view of it that keeps going on. The scientists still said, you know, this is just a really terrible thing and you're going to like impede the ability of scientists to give good advice. So, no, actually, you're just going to impede the ability of scientists to give sloppy advice, which is probably what you want. So the broader scientific community failed to hold the scientists accountable. Uh, and I think this case shows how difficult it is to respond to criticism that comes from outside one's expert community. It is really important that one not leap to the defense of your colleagues, because maybe they did mess up, and to take it very seriously when uh, things are, charges are laid um, against them and criticisms are laid against them. Now, the um, expert community generally has to respond to criticism. The good news is that not every expert has to respond to every criticism. That would be exhausting. And that would be impossible. And that would make climate deniers' life super easy. Because then they could just keep leveling criticism, and if everyone has to respond all the time, no one does any future research. But you still have to respond to the criticisms raised. So how do you do that? It's a collective matter. If you look at a, an exemplar like <clears throat> realclimate.org, there you have a community of climate modelers that collectively take in criticism from anyone 
and collectively respond to it. So that if someone raises a concern, like you should see the responses to ClimateGate, they have very nice detailed accounts of what actually one should think about those criticisms. So the rest, there's not the entire, every expert who is criticized always have to respond to every criticism. But every criticism needs a response from someone within the community. Otherwise, how is the, expert, uh, the public going to think that the expert community is actually responsive to criticism? And not just a collection of people repeating things on the basis of unfounded authority. So this is the second basis for the, uh, assessing, the social uh, for assessing expertise. And that is to look at the social conditions for expertise. So the public needs to know whether an expert community is functioning well as an ep epistemic community. Are there spaces for raising criticisms? Are criticisms being responded carefully to? Whether they're raised from inside or outside the community? Is the community exhibiting circling the wagon phenomena? And is there appropriate diversity within the community to make sure that a, a range of views are actually being raised internally? So expert communities need to display some of their communal epistemic functioning. Uh, and luckily, this is getting easier and easier with some of our online forums that are moderated well and carefully, like realclimate.org. OK. But you might think, oh, god, isn't this enough? Kevin, we don't we have enough here? We have um, uh, scientists uh, explicating their judgment. We have a well-functioning scientific community. Um, surely we can just stop there, right? And I'm going to argue in the next section, the final section, that actually that's not adequate. And it's partly because usually the way, way people stop here is they say, well, then you just trust um, consensus. So Elizabeth Anderson in 2011 paper wrote, before consensus, the best course for laypersons is to suspend judgment. Once a consensus of trustworthy experts is consolidated, laypersons are well advised to accept it. So all you need is, on Anderson's view, is, you know, I, I don't, if, you, if you sort of want to stop here, just wait for a consensus to form you know, from a well-functioning epistemic community, and you're done. We don't have to go further. However, I think uh, the mere presence of consensus is insufficient. Indeed, even in Elizabeth Anderson's view, it should only be a consensus of trustworthy experts, which means you have to figure out whether or not all the experts who are making up the consensus are trustworthy. So you're still going to be stuck with individual expert assessment. Even so, even if there is a, a consensus of trustworthy experts, how those experts come to consensus formation is crucial. So is it just part of their training? They all just think a certain thing? Or, in fact, um, have alternatives been raised and set aside? Has there been an appropriate debate? And on a pragmatic level, waiting for um, consensus incentivizes those actors who would like to forestall a consensus. If you never rely on experts without them coming to consensus, it's super easy to make sure consensus never forms and we never act. Right, so that is not a good strategy. I think uh, in lots of cases, waiting <coughs> for consensus is exactly the wrong call, that we have to decide which experts to trust before consensus is formed. So this means we have to assess individual experts. Um, and I think actually this is sort of what we do when we decide to rely and assess experts anyway, is we focus on individuals. Um, experts should be willing to give explanations of judgment, the basis one. Experts should be trained by a well-functioning expert community, or at least be interacting and, and talking with you could have someone who comes in from outside, but they have to be interacting with that community. <coughs> and what I'm going to argue is the third basis is, is a, a need to show commitment to important values, in particular, the value of inquiry. And secondly, there needs to be shared social and ethical values with the public. All right. So let me take you to these in turn. Value inquiry means having the proper regard for evidence. Um, sometimes this is also called having scientific integrity. Um, so you don't make up your data. You don't cherry pick your evidence. 
Cherry picking is actually really easy to spot among experts. They keep saying the same thing over and over again, and other experts say, hey, that's not looking at the whole range of considerations, and then they still focus on the narrow thing that they want to focus on without saying why they're not looking at the rest of it. And then you can go, oh, you don't have integrity, do you? That's a beautiful example. <coughs> so have properly responding to criticism. So when you have a, a scientist who uh, cherry picks evidence and then other scientists point out that they're cherry picking evidence and then there's no response as to why and they keep cherry picking the evidence. Yeah, that's not a trustworthy expert. Um, in addition, experts should change their minds when new evidence is presented or be able to explain why the new evidence does not change their mind. So if something new comes up, the expert doesn't get to just keep repeating the same thing over and over again. <coughs> they have to either think something different or explain why the new evidence doesn't actually uh, matter to their view in some important way. Further, and this is a, amazing when you see experts fail this test, um, sometimes when you ask experts what evidence would change their minds, or experts, I should put that in quotes, um, what evidence would change their minds, they say, oh, no evidence would ever change my mind. Um, <laughs> right, so then it's got nothing to do with the evidence, does it? <laughs> but then, then you sort of know that that's not what's, what's going on with them, and they aren't valuing inquiry properly. So this, is, this kind of value of inquiry is displayed by a dialogical responsiveness a willingness to respond to criticism and to say things like, what might change your mind? Um, there's a, a purveyor, Fred Singer, of this a lack of integrity. He's a woman who's actually in an essay that I wrote for this lovely collection, Bullshit Philosophy. Um, I got to use bullshit repeatedly in an essay. It was great. <laughs> um, so, you know, what does uh, this guy do? He ignores inconvenient evidence. He cherry picks evidence. He kept repeating, look, the climate cooled between 1940 and 1970. And this was an important criticism in 1988. But by 1992, it was not an important criticism because we had sulfate aerosols coming into the modeling that explained the decline of temperature between 1940 and 1970. Uh, Fred Singer continued to repeat the graph without talking about sulfates throughout the 1990s. I mean, this is after a Scientific American article came out. He keeps like blah, blah, blah. So it's like well-known public information. There's a complete lack of uptake of new information criticism. So we can find a lack of integrity in a pattern of argumentation. I can find that even though I'm not a climate modeler. It takes a little bit of work, but it doesn't require expertise in the field. Now, obviously, experts who lack integrity shouldn't be trusted or relied upon. Just throw them out. Um, and I think this is in many ways more important than credentials. But, you know, regardless of where you got your degree um, or whether or not you've had a prize, if you don't have this, then we shouldn't be listening to you. And this is a way to throw someone out. How to actually detect a lack of integrity? As I said, you, know, you can do it without having expertise, but usually it involves tracking someone's arguments over a period of time or going back for a few years and seeing how they respond to various sorts of criticism. Um, this isn't uh, a massive, careful research effort that requires expertise in the field, but it does require paying attention. Um, and for an average member of the public, they would ha it'd have to happen about an issue that they cared about. But this is precisely what members of the public, when they have issues they care about, actually do. It's just, are they looking for the right kinds of things? Do um, members of the public actually expect experts to change their minds in the face of new evidence? This is the hard part about how you do science education, which is another talk altogether. Um, but how you actually detect a lack of integrity, and then further, whether we should catalog this lack of integrity. You know, like um, there was Beale's list for predatory journals. Should there be? Heather's list for <laughs> experts who lack integrity. I don't know. Beale's list has uh, stopped functioning, so. <clears throat> All right. That much is uncontroversial. Clearly, we want experts who have basic integrity, who value inquiry. But I also think we need to have uh, commensurate social and ethical values. 
And that is a more controversial claim. So why do I think this? Well, partly it's because social and ethical values are really important in science. Since you've read my book, you know this. It's just like review time. Um, there are two crucial places for values in science. These aren't the only two places, but they're enough for getting on with for this argument. Um, there's like more richer accounts of how values interweave into science in multiple places. First, values direct the efforts of scientists. So are experts actually asking the right questions? Um, are the right range of hypotheses being considered? And then second, values decide what counts as sufficient evidence. So how much evidence is enough? It involves how much uncertainty we're willing to accept and what sort of consequence of errors are more important to us or more worrisome to us. Do you want to sort of avoid the false positives more or the false negatives more, for example? So let me run through some examples really quickly. How am I doing on time? We have about 40 minutes. Okay, great, because I'm nearly done. All right, so just for looking at how values shape the research agenda, um, it's really helpful to actually look at medical research because, wow, there are lots of issues there. Um, so uh, Maya Goldenberg has ar argued that one of the ways in which the public should uh, attempt, or the scientists should attempt to build trust with the public around vaccines is to care more about rare adverse reactions and why they happen in particular people. Instead of just sort of throwing up their hands like, oh, we don't get it. Um, really focusing on that because that's a huge issue for parents who uh, are trying to decide whether or not to vaccinate their kids. Um, Kyle White and Robert Kreese talk about um, really nice collaborations where climate change is affecting new food sources. Um, <clears throat> Jim Brown has argued that you know, one of the reasons why he doesn't trust pharmaceutical research is because it's really rare that um, you're actually examining patentable treatments against non-patentable treatments. Generally, all this research are patentable treatments because that's where the money gets made. But it might be, in some cases, that... Um, a dietary change would actually be equally or even more effective with less side effects. Uh, but you can't patent broccoli, so no one's researching that. And then um, Jacob Segenga has argued that um, side effects uh, in medical interventions, interventions are really poorly studied. He has this really nice paper called The Hollow Hunt for Harms, where he argues that just medical research is structured to be bad at finding these things. And, you know, if the, when the public becomes aware of these things, they get angry and think, well, why should I trust these experts when they say such and such is what I should do? Interaction with and collaboration with relevant publics can help shape research agendas when scientists do this so they, the scientists actually answer questions that the public cares about. And um, then the public knows that uh, the scientists have considered the kinds of possibilities that matter to the public in their research. For evidential sufficiency, we can just look briefly at neonicotinoids. This might not be a good example anymore because maybe we actually do know that they're really bad for bee health um, in field conditions, which is the question. So neonicotinoids are a class of very effective pesticide, insecticide that coats seeds and then imbues the entire plant with the pesticides. You don't have to spray it ever. So awesome, except um, they end up in pollen. They also end up in droplets of water that extruded from the plant in the morning. It's called gatation. It's a weird thing that I found out about looking at this that I didn't know about that plants do. Um, these are uh, neurotoxic and immunological suppressants. That's how they kill insects, so they're really good at it. Um, they are first used in the 1990s, uh, but they became widespread around the turn of the century. Bee population difficulties appeared as the use of neonicotinoids rose, and they sort of show up several years after neonicotinoids become widespread in any given country. You can sort of track that. It's kind of odd. But correlation is not causation. Right? So is this actually the cause? There are lots of confounders. There are lots of things that harm bees. Uh, people are worried about mites and funguses, and there's climate change, and there's habitat loss, and there are hard winters, and there are a loss of um, uh, changing farming practices, so you have less wildflowers on the verge, all these kinds of things. So in order to study this, the controlled studies end up being pretty small, um, and then People claim, claim the doses actually given to the bees aren't uh, 
realistic for field tests or what would bees actually encounter in the field. And so there's a debate among scientists about, well, okay, how dangerous are neonicotinoids? <coughs> and here, um, you don't want to wait necessarily until there's consensus. Like this is one of those really complex cases, very hard to study in accurate ways um, to really know for sure. So what are you willing to risk? And different people have different answers. So if you ask farming communities, they think this is a really important tool, and they want to make sure the evidence is really strong before they give up neonicotinoids. If you ask people who farm fruit from fruit trees and are dependent on bees for pollination, or um, environmental groups, they say, no, we know enough already. This is, we have plenty of evidence. So which experts should you rely upon? You should rely upon the experts that actually share your values that would judge as you would in the face of the complicated evidence given your values. So the values matter both in uh, conditions of disagreement among experts. You want to trust experts who both value inquiry. Like if they're not valuing inquiry, if they're not behaving with integrity, throw them out. But the ones that are left, um, trust experts who value inquiry and who share your social and ethical values because you want to make, uh, you want to rely upon experts who would say weigh um, risks of error the way you would or who would frame the research questions the way you think they should given your concerns. And even in conditions of consensus, values matter. Because if you have a consensus among experts, even including experts who share your values, you know that um, your values and concerns have been taken into account somehow in, in, the ex in the expert community discussion. We want to trust and rely on experts who would make judgments about their research and the available evidence the way we would if we were experts with integrity. That's sort of, rather than becoming experts, we can find that proxy that is the right expert to rely upon. So here we have the third basis, the right values. First value has to be valuing inquiry, but then they need to show that they share our social and ethical values, both because values shape the research agenda and because they shape evidential assessments. Now what this means is we're not going to have universal expertise. That expertise might depend upon which expert you should trust might depend upon your community's values. And so we have to give up the ideal of universal expertise. Uh, given that I don't think we've lived in a world with universal expertise for about 100 years, I don't think this is a lot to give up. It might be better just to recognize that that's actually the world that we live in. All right, so in conclusion, what I tried to do today is argue that we have three plausible bases for assessment that don't require expertise of us. I didn't say it was going to be easy, <laughs> but we don't actually have to become experts. So we can look at the explication of judgment. That explication sh should, given the third basis, actually include the values that the, judgment, the expert has, well-functioning expert community, and the individual values of the expert. There are kind of virtues of the tripod. Um, the first is that we can actually assess experts without becoming experts. So none of this requires even interactional expertise. You don't have to pass as an expert to listen to experts' judgments, to ask experts questions. They might even sound like naive questions. So you don't need to pass the Collins and Evans Turing test to do this. We don't have to rely on just short-term expert success. We can actually assess experts who, um, uh, you know, deal with complicated, rich topics. And we can't tell in the near term when we might need to be making a judgment based on their expertise whether or not they've got it right. But we can still assess whether or not they might be the right person for us to trust. If you have the sort of tripod that I've argued for, then experts and non-experts know better what is expected of them, including the demand of explication if you can't show short-term success as an expert, including telling the public what your values might be. And the public 
can know that experts should actually change their mind and maybe uh, the public will be better at also hearing responses to the criticisms that are raised, both internally and externally. The other cool thing, which I don't want to uh, talk about right now because everyone's looking kind of tired, is the fact that I think this could be used for non-expert systems, non-human expert systems as well. So I think this all works for AI um, and neural nets, which is kind of cool. Um, but we can talk about that in Q&A if you like. But if we go with this view, we have to give up the idea of value-free or neutral expertise. For some issues, there may be no one expert that everyone trusts. Um, but I don't think that's too much to give up to be able to build bridges with the expert community, between the expert community and public again. Thanks. Thanks very much, Heather. We're going to take a pause for about one minute and then we're going to take uh, questions. Give you time to collect your thoughts, you know, point your questions. All right, maybe we should get going. We'll start, I think, we'll start, I think, with students. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I want to turn to something you stressed quite a bit, the first base that we should demand of experts to give explanations. Mm -hmm. And then you further stressed that uh, you don't need expertise to follow an explanation. And I, I follow that. If, like you don't, if someone's explaining how to play a video game, you don't need to know the code behind it to know if they're explaining it correctly. So yeah. that's how I understand it. But thinking of my undergraduate field economics, I think that I would be able to argue for a lot of senseless stuff very convincingly. And it would take a lot mm -hmm. from the non-expert to refute me. Yeah. So much so that I worry that we're not not only talking about the public, but a very enthusiastic enthusiast, and we're losing the public kind of democratic angle a bit there. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you could, no doubt, an expert could blow smoke and deceive a member of the public. So that's one reason why you want to make sure that um, you have a well-functioning expert community. To you know, if you did that, hopefully you would get called out for making stuff up um, and sort of spouting off nonsense. Um, that's really important to sort of keep you in check. Um, but I also want to sort of push back against the idea that there is the general public. All right, so Dewey, I think I, I use Dewey here. There are publics, right? And, and the, the people that actually you want to um, be most involved here are the interested publics. They're the ones who care about what you're doing. And they're the ones who are going to bother to say, be interested in figuring out whether or not to rely upon you. So I don't think you know it's a general a problem for the general public because I'm not sure there is a general public. We're already sort of all split up into publics, and that's okay. <clears throat> right, people can be interested in what they're interested in. Hi, that was a really great talk. Um, so I'm kind of interested in what you said um, in number two about um, diversity within the, ex uh, the expert community. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of interested in this in sort of a kind of a social, moral, uh, epistemology kind of um, view. So like the idea that, of course, um, experts can let uh, uh, do diversity. They can um, let like non-normative groups, marginalised groups, into this yeah. uh, this place, and on paper it would look super, super diverse. Yeah. But the that I suppose that doesn't necessarily make that the knowledge that's produced any more diverse, or whether or not the groups that are entering to this will be listened to, will they be mm -hmm. done testimonial justice? Yeah. That sort of external and how I guess that can be how. Yeah. It's a big question for you. How can yeah. we make it more diverse? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so like, um, we could talk about how we can make it more diverse, but I, I think you're, you, I want to point to sort of one of the things I think that's underlying your question, which is just because it's more diverse doesn't mean it's better. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like, we know there are historical cases where having diversity really helped. Mm -hmm. right? Like, bringing uh, women into primatology, wow. It changed a lot of stuff. Bringing women into uh, archaeology and anthropology changed a lot of stuff. Um, it doesn't mean it always happens. 
and it's not any by means a perfect measure, but it helps broaden the range of considerations. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't want to rest the entire assessment of the well function expert community on diversity. Right, that would, that would be a mistake. So it's like one part of the puzzle, and this is why it's really important to that criticisms that are raised, because you can always have expert capture, right? Like if you're sort of worried about how you become an expert, mm -hmm. you drink, you might, it might be considered drinking the Kool-Aid, yeah. right? And you start believing everything that's inside the expert community. So this is why it's really important that expert communities also grapple with criticisms that come from outside. Mm -hmm. Because it might be that that's exactly what the expert community needs to hear. Or maybe, you know, it's the usual nonsense from the outside of the expert community. And then the expert can explain why it's not applicable or not relevant or beside the point. Um, and then I can also help the expert, too, because you just have to express that idea clearly. It's always helpful to be challenged. Um, so, I, you know, I don't think it's a panacea. It's just part of the piece, a part of the puzzle for a well-functioning epistemic community. Yeah. So does that help? Yeah, kind of. I was just thinking about like whether or not they'd be listened to. They did have no expertise, I suppose, coming in as experts, whether or not like. So you know, if we look at these historical cases, what happens? To take the the women coming into primatology, um, or actually or even archaeology, they're listened to because um, they learn the techniques and the tools, and then they're able to generate alternative hypotheses and show that they're just as plausible using the techniques and tools that are already well uh, accepted by the, the expert community. Okay. So you have this sort of, and then that's, that's super powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I have a question about, uh, in a way, like the implications of your uh, sort of like final point. And uh, I might have missed something, but the way I understand it is that uh, you argue that there is no such a thing as universal expertise, and when there is disagreement among experts, we should individually trust experts that are trustworthy and whose values align with ours. Yeah. My question is, in a, in a multi, uh, sort of like in a plural society where there's multiple values, yeah. uh, how do we pragmatically reach uh, decisions if there is disagreement among experts? Yeah. Uh, do we do it democratically? So just, you know, saying who has the majority and then just follow that. I'm thinking specifically yeah. about the case of the EU, uh -huh. but I think more generally, sort of like any uh -huh. pluralistic society where you have disagreement among experts and disagreement among sort of like values and worldviews. Yeah. yeah, okay. So first of all, I don't want to say that there's never universal expertise. Um, so especially if you, you know, either with, with easily to assess success, yeah, you know, like there, there, is, there are chess masters, they're grand masters. Everyone acknowledges that that's the best, those are the best chess players in the world. Um, but even among uh, more difficult to assess experts, there, there could be experts who are just so good at understanding their field and explaining what's going on that you know, they actually garner the, the trust of the vast majority of the world. So I don't want to rule that out. Um, but I think holding it up as the ideal that somehow we have to find the one authoritative expert in a particular field, or you know, the three whatever authoritative experts in the field, is um, the wrong way to go. So your question about asking a uh, question about how to reach um, agreement about pressing political issues is a real one. Um, but it doesn't, you know, I don't think it just comes down. Our democratic processes aren't so thin as just voting. Thank goodness. Um, if that was everything we do, we just like run governments by referenda, and we all know how badly that would be. But, so, um, <laughs> so, so what, what we need to do is have genuine deliberations, and then think about um, areas where you know we either um, can find temporary agreements for getting on with, like you know maybe you try. So, for let's take the new Nicaragua example. Um, it's really important that there are some jurisdictions that are restricting them. If you are one of the jurisdictions that's like, let's keep using them because we think they're effective, but you could watch what's happening in jurisdictions that are restricting them and see whether or not populations are balancing back. Um, now that's going to take a while because it turns out they last longer in the environment than we thought initially, which is another reason to think maybe not so great. Or alternatively, you could also, um, I've been looking at some, there were some studies of a, uh, Farming, like how effective the unicamotes actually were, and you know, in, in actual fields, they only increase yields by like 10%. So then it's like, well, is this really important? 
if you point this out to farmers, that there are actually better techniques for increasing crop yields, does that make it easier to get rid of the main <coughs> snowy? Or is there a policy option where you um, say, we're going to support farmers, we're going to you know, bump up the um, uh, ability to ensure crops against catastrophic loss while we phase these things out, to see how it actually goes for you, to sort of provide a safety net? Is there a policy option like that sort of like compromises things and that makes the worries less, less pressing? So, you know, that's how democratic decision making goes. You see if you can find an area of common ground, even in a space of contested expertise, contested values. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much for that great talk. Um, I want to go back to your first uh, explication of judgment. Do you, do you want me to go back to the slide? No, no, no. no okay. I'm, I'm, <laughs> rhetorically. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so going back to it, so we're there now. Um, I worry that sometimes um, some experts are not expert in communicating their expertise and knowledge. And let's say it's all part of this this, this tripod of trust that uh, and that's one part of it. Yeah. But let's say that they have really generic values that you can have, everyone can subscribe, such as truth. We want the truth. That's like at a very abstract level. And then Basically, Truth, you know, avoid uh, error. Which one's more important? Yeah, yeah, but let's say they, they, they have both, right? They, they're they're <laughs> they all kind have of both. Side. <laughs> let's say they're business and they hold these two values and they're a well functioning expert community, yeah. but they're really bad at explaining their yeah. judgment and expertise. Yeah. What's your take on that? What, okay. what, what's your thought on that? So, so as a, if I'm a member of the public and I encounter an expert like that, that's going to be really hard for me to think like I can rely upon them. I can't tell whether or not they have any expertise at all, because what they say makes no sense whatsoever, and they're not success accessible. If they're not, as I'm assuming they're one of the ones that you can't just yeah. say, "Are you right or not?" Right? Okay. So, assuming we have that kind of thing, what what they need is they need uh, one of their fellow experts to help explain what's going on. Like. So fine, they're not one of the experts that's out there talking about these issues. They're, they're not an expert, perhaps, that is on the science advisory committee who needs to talk to politicians or communicate with the public. Maybe they're just a person who, you know, runs their lab. And when journalists call and they say gobbledygook, the journalists go, um, who else can I talk to? All right, so not every scientist has to be an expert that we assess for trust and reliability. That's okay. They still could be a contributing member to their expert community. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> good. There's a question of then, um, 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 also relevance of what they're saying to what you want to get out of. But I would discuss that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we've got a few questions queued up, so if I can just ask you to hold your hand up if you've got a question. Yeah. Um, okay, my point kind of builds off Alessandro's point, and I'm, I'm wondering if, um, also about the political um, implications of, of your um, model, and I'm just thinking if the experts' values that you then trust would mirror your own values, then I'm wondering if that kind of, if the logical extension of that would be to then kind of slip in democracy into also the scientists that we choose for um, policy making. Mm -hmm. In that they would, as in, and currently they obviously have no level of, of democracy, but are merely chosen on based on something like accolades or availability or something. I don't think that's true. Um, so if you're going to, so you're talking about scientists reporting to official advisory positions? Um, yeah, policy advice. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you're talking about a committee uh, advisory, usually those are actually, um, I don't know how you do it in the UK, you might just like, we just pick the best experts because we trust them. Um, in the US, they have to come with a range of interests represented. Usually you need some from academia, some from industry, some from maybe a couple from the NGO. Uh, in fact, the Federal Advisory Committee Act requires a balance of interests from 1972. So already you have imbued in this a sense of the importance of this. When you have an individual science advisor, like a chief science advisor position, which I know you have here, Canada got rid of theirs, and now they're bringing them back. Not clear what's going to happen with that. Um, uh, 
you know, the only way in which the chief science advisor is in some ways democratically accountable is that they actually have some shared values with the politician that appoints them. And the only way that they will actually build trust with that politician in practice is to have a sense of shared values. So that's actually built into the structures, amazingly enough. Okay, so we've got, I think, 10 questions in 20 minutes. <laughs> Are you up for it? <laughs> we'll see how far we get. <laughs> Concise as you can, please. Phyllis. Um, I was maybe can I was interested in the explanation and fascinated by what you said at the end. So particularly about the explanation and AI. Oh um, yeah. Especially in the context of the you know the I can't remember what it's called GDPR or whatever this kind of declaration of the kind of requirement of explanation for algorithms and the yeah yeah about what this is going to mean. Yeah. So I mean, um, I think uh, you know algorithms. Especially neural, so let's talk about neural net algorithms that are like opaque even to the ones that the, the computer science put them together. Um, so they're great for systems where they're really easy to assess whether or not they're success. Like, you know, reading sl tissue slides. You, you know, false positive, false negative, you can retrain them based on errors that they make. Fantastic. Just use the darn thing, right? But when you're talking about whether or not someone should be released on parole, Sure, you can assess whether or not someone who's released reoffends, but you can't assess whether or not someone who's kept in jail would have reoffended. There's no way to assess that counterfactual. So then, using a proprietary algorithm, and what happens in the U.S., or using a neural net algorithm that's opaque, is completely irresponsible because you can't tell whether or not it's gonna it's getting it right enough in both directions that you care about. So in that case, you're going to need um, explanations of judgment. And I know that AI scientists are working on how to extract out of neural net systems uh, explanations. I know people um, are talking now about making sure that non-neural net algorithms that you know, humans construct, that if you're going to use them for issues of public import, they don't get to be proprietary, because then you can't assess how they're functioning. Um, so. So my view is that that's exactly right, but you're also going to need to make sure that the expert community that's building these things is well-functioning and maybe more diverse. <laughs> and maybe she gets Sabina Leonelli to come in and talk about the baseline data that's used to construct these things and how that's curated. Um, and you also want to make sure that the AI systems have the, the right values. Um, so when it's success successful, that's super easy to assess because it's, it'll be successful in the ways that you want it to be successful. When it's not success accessible uh, in an easy way, then you, know, you don't have to worry about, about integrity because I don't think the AI is going to cherry pick deliberately in a deceptive way or you know, do the sort of things. Uh, maybe it's not responsive to criticism. You want to make sure that that's built in. Um, uh, but you want to find out, you know, what are the values? So explanation of judgment is going to have to involve why does this thing think this and what does it care about? What, what is, and in AI terms, like how, how are things weighted in its judgment? Yeah. Those are all going to be purpose. <laughs> yes, yes they are, yes they are. Which is why right now, like if you're going to use a, a neural net, you know, you better make sure it's, it's easy to assess whether or not it's doing things right in you know, both directions of error that can occur. And otherwise, you probably shouldn't use it. Because we don't know what it's doing. <laughs> Why would you rely on that? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, thank you for your talk. I had a question about uh, power, I guess. Uh, so kind of going off of what Alessandro and, and Catherine are talking about. Um, so with this kind of individualistic model of deciding on like when to trust who, um, it makes me think about what happens when uh, certain values align with certain power. Um, so if you have, uh, for instance, like certain values that align with a group of people who have like a lot of political power, um, what do you do when that produces then a world where there are fewer experts who do have the values that you share and whose own expertise is devalued because the feeling that I get from this um, is kind of like the idea of not striving for like a universal like consensus 
uh, which I agree is kind of an impossible goal, but it also kind of has the connotation of, oh, like you just choose your expert and then you kind of let that be um, like what it is. You don't like try to change, I don't know, people's values or like the power, like the expertise models, I guess. Well, of course, you can always try to change people's values. This is what we should, the debate we should be having all the time in our political forum. It's like, what should our values be, and why should, are those the right values? So, like, none of this is meant to say, um, stop that. Uh, if you know, if if the people who have a lot of power are supporting experts that have values that disagree with yours, you know, your sort of job as a citizen is partly to point that out and be like, no, these are the wrong values, and here are experts that I think express that more, and, I don't know, go to their Patreon site. Um, <laughs> there, there are ways of sort of supporting experts now that are really interesting in terms of sort of ground swells. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it's not, it, none of this, this is, this is probably like a, a, maybe another way of saying expertise isn't going to solve our governance problems. They still exist, and and for us to think that somehow expertise would solve the governance problems was delusional. And maybe we should get over that. Maybe that's like like a sub conclusion. <laughs> John, um, what evidence would change your mind? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. So like the snarky answer would be like, I'm not a scientist. I'm a philosopher. <laughs> this is a normative view. <laughs> um, uh, you know, so I, uh, I couldn't... Well, that's a question. I'm, I'm assuming you are an expert in answering the question how can yeah. the public assess expertise. Yeah, well, I just, I've been only thinking about this for like a couple of years, so I don't know if I'm an expert yet. Um, <laughs> this is a new view. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I, c I could imagine a situation where like... Um, People are, you know, experts are behaving properly, and uh, they're expressing value judgments. Um, and you know, it's like it's still just going horribly wrong. And I'd be like, oh, well, okay, now what's what's wrong? The, the view I had, you know, like if you're meeting these sorts of criteria, and still um, the community, the, the the public is utterly unable to assess the experts. Like maybe this is too hard, and maybe. Members, even interested members of the public just can't do it. So that would, that would force me to have to change, you know, I would be like, oh, okay, well that was, that didn't work. We're gonna have to do some kind of mediating there, or maybe the view's wrong. Um, or I could see a situation where it looks like everything lines up, but um, still the public is like, nope. And I'd be like, okay, well now I need to go ask them why, <laughs> and maybe, figure out what's missing and they count, or maybe there's some flaw in the view. So, you know, there could just be failures. But certainly in those cases of very extreme differences of value between the expert groups and the public opinion, are you not already in situations like that? So that's the thing that I, uh, that I, I really should see how things would play out. Um, I'm hard pressed to, find cases where all of the experts have one set of values and all of the public that is sort of contested has another set of values. It usually isn't so clean. So, so what's going on there, right? And, and in some ways, what I like about this account is it gives me some things to look for in, in how to evaluate this, those kinds of cases. Um, so an extreme case... Shoot, we have a long list. I mean, so we could, we could we, the extreme change we could talk about is like the way in which some segments of the American public insist that humans didn't evolve, right? So what's going on there is I think um, the U.S. conversation around faith and science has really distorted people's ability to disagree with science. So if you're told not only science says humans evolved and you have to believe science, that's going to totally get people's back up. Instead of saying, you know, you can believe something that science doesn't say, it's just not going to be a scientific belief. It's fine. It's a different basis of belief. That's a thing, too. But somehow that's not how these things are communicated. 
So, yeah. Um, so, I've been doing a lot of thinking lately about, thank you for your talk, again. Um, I've been thinking a couple of different ways about trying to get the public on board to like, as like some thick new stuff through security work. What I was gonna ask, and I know that this might immediately sound snarky, but I'm actually ser sort of serious. Yeah, only sort of. Um, is the ability to do this assessment, does it require expertise? Yeah, no, no, so I don't, I don't think it does, right? Like, um, I'm saying this specifically in the context where like a lot of people haven't gone to university. Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of assumed knowledge about the people in this room that you can assume where you can tell to all of us in an hour and we all totally get it. <laughs> yeah, okay. But we've had 10 years of training. Ten, yeah, and, 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 and good training. So one of the problems that uh, I think that this, that this view has is it will work well once science education's fixed. Because right now, science education is completely <laughs> screwed up, right? Okay. Now, in the meantime, right? In, in the meantime, it at least gives members of the public something to work with. Yeah. Because most members of the public who are interested in things do track things over time. Hmm. They catch on to things they care about really quickly, in my experience. Yeah. So, you know, the members of the public aren't daft. No. Um, and when they care about something, they actually read up on it and figure stuff out about it, and then they start finding experts that they want to ask questions of, and so things the, move forward. Do cognitive biases in like confirmation bias and stuff interrupt that narrative? So we all have confirmation biases. Uh, hopefully, even experts have confirmation biases, right? So, so hopefully, um, the uh, the interaction with the experts will undercut some of that. That's what you know, learning is supposed to do. Um, what is interesting to me about this kind of view is it's not clear to me that you know, the Kahan style bias, whether it's a bias or whether it's an appropriate judgment. So most of the studies that are cor finding correlations between um, the public, their values, and certain views they hold don't differentiate between the public picking experts that tell them stuff they want to hear, and the public weighing various risks and framing the research properly. There's just a correlation. And I suspect that the public is, in fact, a mix. Right? Like, there are people who are like, I will never listen to public, an expert who says stuff I don't want to hear. Um, and then there are people who are like, oh, well, I just think that the, the expert will make judgments the way I would. I mean, they might not say it as nicely as that, but that's what they're sort of thinking. And I'd like to see studies that actually differentiate those, and how to do surveys that would differentiate among that so we could study it would be really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was really great. Um, I have loads of questions. I don't know which one to ask. Uh, I'll go with this one, just because um, it's not something anybody's um, mentioned. So when you say that, um, always scientists should be able to say um, which evidence would make them change their mind. Yes. So there's a bit of a philosophy of science question. I just wondered whether that kind of puts too much um, responsibility on the evidence, if you see what I mean. Because like, in, in, in cases where you have, say, lots of theories that are consistent with the evidence, you might never be in a position to really conclusively say anything based on evidence from a theoretical point of view, right? Yeah. So, well, so the converse of that would be that I should never be able to say conclusively what evidence would say. <coughs> none, none of it is supposed to be conclusive. Mm -hmm. um, so let's take the case where uh, you have a whole bunch of theories and uh, the current existing evidence doesn't differentiate among them. I would hope that scientists would be working hard trying to figure out what evidence would actually differentiate them and then go and finding that evidence. So then they would be able to say which evidence might persuade them that one of the theories was right, even if they didn't have the ability yet to get that evidence. That's like how you direct research agendas. So part of this is thinking about how scientists are conducting their research. Right? That doesn't mean you can have a crucial experiment. Do you have made that very clear? Yeah, right? I mean, I guess that's my point, is that there will always be judgments and inferences. That's right. Made. So. No such thing as getting rid of judgment. Yeah. Nevertheless, 
if the evidence is actually really important to your view, you should be able to say what evidence would change it. Otherwise, I'm not so sure the evidence is that important to your view. Um, yeah, so I had a quick question about how the tripod of trust um, related to the setup. So um, I was quite persuaded by the tripod of trust, and it seems to give like quite a nice account of when when it's appropriate to trust an expert. Right? Mm -hmm. but, um, it seemed like the setup wanted to say that there'd been a collapse in the trust of experts. And was the thought that the tripod of trust can also help us explain why it is that there has been that collapse? So it's also a sort of sociological explanatory framework. Because yeah. if that was the case, then I'm sort of less persuaded. Because it seems to me like, if anything, scientists have got better at one to three of the tripod of trust, right? I mean, yeah. I think they, they've, they've got much better at explaining their judgments and the, the, the expert yeah. community is functioning what better than it used to be. So it couldn't explain the drop in um, uh, trust in experts. It seems like there must be something else going on. Yeah, so um, first of all, you know, like I don't, there isn't a universal drop in trust of experts that's been measured, oddly enough, right? Like, so I, but we all feel like we're in this crisis. Or at least, you know, in my in, in Canada and the US, or something. Uh, you probably have a year after Brexit. We've all had enough of that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay. So, so I'm trying to figure out, like, okay, um, and you never know. Like, it could be that these sort of crises are about to demonstrate a plummet in assessment of experts. Uh, um, it. I suspect that the causes of that sort of, if there is a decline or an undermining, that you're right, it's not about um, experts sort of failing across this sort of tripod. It's more about um, you know patterns of reporting, uh, belief in what ex a mis a mis maybe a misunderstanding of what expertise is that underlies you know number one. That's it. That's a huge problem um, and an ongoing problem. And uh, you know, for some of the cases, the fact that values actually matter, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of pushback in expert communities against that kind of claim, and that's just not helping them. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to make like say, oh, I've got the causal story for all the trends because we're not really sure what the trends are. It's so good being a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> I can go off zeitgeist instead of data. <laughs> right. Oh, um, uh, it, does the tripod of trust, is, does it work because it's the same as the way that experts evaluate each other, or is it meant to be a proxy for the way that experts evaluate each other? It's meant to be a proxy. It's meant to. It's meant to be. Um, so there, there are certain aspects of it that, that clearly are about how the experts evaluate each other, right? Um, but without the sort of intensity that happens within the expert so it's community. So it's a degree, a difference of degree, then, rather than a difference of kind. Potentially, I haven't really thought about like the way in which experts evaluate each other. <coughs> so that so would be an interesting thing, thing to do. Yeah. If you think it's the same thing, then then that's actually is that is that good? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I have to think about that. Um, yeah. That, well, I mean, it, it, yeah. Is it simply a mirror of the way that experts evaluate other experts, just as you say, with a different degree of, as it were, epistemic intensity? Yeah. Or, and detail. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, or, you know, because you, you've got sort of, you know, the cognitive level, the individual level, the sociological level, yeah. all in there, which might mirror. You know, exactly what somebody might find in the lab ethnography. Or, nice. or, or is it, but, but if it is, then then all it is is simply saying, do the same thing as scientists. Or you say, here's a way which you can do it without doing the same thing as yes. scientists. Yes. That's quite, I think that's quite important for you to be able to. Yeah. Yeah. So I think actually, um, this is, you know, you wouldn't do the same thing as a scientist. Because you, first of all, like, if you're a non expert, you don't have the language. You don't have the, the facility to, to you know interact 
inside of the expert, realm of expert judgment. So that means that um, when, you know, as a member of the public, if I am engaging or, or trying to assess an expert, I'm going to be looking at not technical reports, but how the expert speaks to journalists or how they speak you know, in an interview um, on a television program or maybe in a public talk and maybe see how they respond to questions raised by audience members who might be members of the public. Maybe even I get to ask a question, right? So, and that is not me acting as a scientist, but as a non-expert interacting with an expert. But the scientist would do exactly the same as a conference. Um, a scientist would do the exact same problem, but with a very different set of questions and a very different set of language and a very different um, ability to press. Right. Okay, I think unfortunately we should wrap up there. My apologies to, uh, to those of you who have questions left unanswered. Um, will you join me anyway in, in thanking Heather once again? Thank you. Thank you.